In our previous video, we talked about exponential functions, how they look, right? We saw that the most general exponential function will look like y equals uh, some c times a to the x plus one, uh, plus k, excuse me. That's the most general form right there. And how adjusting the base and the scalar and the shift affects the graph here. We want to kind of reverse this process now. Let's not let's not come up with the equation, see what the graph looks like. What if we know what the graph looks like? Can we come up with an equation, right? So let's suppose we have an exponential function with no transformations in it whatsoever. It's just f of x equals a to the x. How do we determine what the base is supposed to be? Well, if we know a point, like say it goes through the points 2, 9, this would tell us that we come over 2 and we have to come up 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, right? We have this point right here. So we have to go through here. We know it also goes through the point uh, 0, 1 and 2, 9. So we know this. So we kind of, we essentially know what the function is going to look like. It would have to look something like this. Whoops. Uh, make sure that you don't cross the x-axis because it's asymptotic to it. So this is what our function is going to look like. So we know the graph, but what does what does the function, what does the formula look like? Now, if, if uh, 2, 9 is a point on the graph that we see right here, that means this is a solution to this equation, right? We can, we can look at f of 2, and in one instance, f of 2 is going to look like a squared. But in another instance, f of 2 is going to equal 9. So we get that 9 equals a squared. If we take the square root of both sides, we end up with a equals 3. Now, when you take square roots, you typically think of plus or minus 3. But remember, when it comes to these bases, the a, we have a stipulation. a has to be positive and a can equal 1. And therefore, that tells us that, whoops, we don't want the negative value. We actually just want a equals 3. That is, the function in play here was f of x equals 3 to the x. All right, so that can help us out with the base. Let's try that again. Um, let's consider the function g of x equals 8 to the x. So just a just a exponential function without transformations in it whatsoever. Okay, what do we do in order to build this function right here? Well, again, since there's no transformations, the standard y-intercept is going to be 1. We also have the point 3 comma 1 8. So that's going to be like super teeny. So we get this point right here. And so we can anticipate that the graph is going to do something like this. This one is going to be a decay model. Notice how it's decreasing over time. So roughly speaking, this is what the graph G would look like. But just like the last example, we can use this point. We can plug it into our formula right here. And so G of 3 tells us that A cubed is going to equal 1 eighth. So taking the cube root of both sides... We end up with a is equal to, well, the cube root of 1 eighth, which is the same thing as the cube root of 1 over the cube root of 8, which gives us 1 half. So that's the base there. And like we saw in the previous video, if your base is less than 1, that's a decay model. If your base is greater than 1, you're going to have a growth model. So this function would be g of x is equal to 1 half to the x power. So we, can, we need a point. We need a point on the graph to determine the base of the function. What if, on the other hand, we do have some transformation in play here? What if we have just a stretch? Uh, so h of x looks like c times a to the x. Well, because there's a stretch, there's two parameters we don't know. We don't know c and we don't know a. So we're going to need two points of data to help us out here. Now, if I could pick any point of data, the y-intercept is going to be my favorite point to use here. So what we see here is the y-intercept is going to equal 3. We also know the other point um, is going to look like 3 to the 24, or 3 comma 24. I can't fit that on the picture, so let me let me relabel the picture as like 3, I think I can get away with this, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, uh, then we get 18, and then 24. I could fit that on there. Okay, so we can take the point 3 comma 24, and we can also take the point um, 0, 3. So that actually would move it here. This is a challenge you often see with exponential functions that because they grow so rapidly, you have to sometimes change the scale in order to fit them into a reasonable picture of any kind. So connecting the dots, we would get something like this. So this is the picture we anticipate. So how do we determine this thing? Well, the, like I said, the y-intercept is the place to get started with. Because when you look at this function, like all the previous ones, the 
horizontal acetal was the x-axis. That only is going to change if we start shifting the graph up and down. So I want you to examine what's the distance. What's the distance here between the asymptote and the function, right? With the, with the y-intercept, I should be saying. What's the distance here between these values? Because it really turns out this is going to help us determine the what 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 the parameter C here is going on here. So I'll come back to that into a little bit. But if we were to plug in, if you plug in your y-intercept into this function right here, what you see is the following. You see that h of 0 is equal to c times a to the 0, which should equal 3. Now, what is a to the 0? That's always going to equal 1, irrelevant of what the base a is, because as long as a is positive and not equal to 1, we know a to the 0 is going to be 1. Heck, we, a could equal 1, and that would still be true. So we get that c is actually equal to 3. So knowing the y-intercept is extremely important because it helped us figure out that c value very quickly, the initial value. Okay, and no, uh, and, and notice the distance between the y-intercept and the horizontal asymptote actually was three units, right? Because remember, this is this is y equals three. So from there, we now learn that our function has the form h of x is equal to three times a to the x. Well, if we use the other point, that can help us determine what a is supposed to be. So we see that h of three is equal to three times a cubed, that should equal 24, in which case if we divide both sides by 3, uh, that would then give us a cubed is equal to 8. And then taking the cube root of both sides, we end up with a equals 2. And so in the end, our function h of x looks like 3 times 2 to the x. So the... the uh, we were able to figure out both the vertical stretch and the base of this exponential function using the points provided. All right, so I want to do one more example of such a thing here, where here the graph of the function is given to us, and we want to come up with a formula to match up here. Now, I'm going to help us out here. Um, I'm going to give us the base. So this function is supposed to be, it has a base of one half, but we don't know the constant it got stretched by, and we don't know yet the shift. Uh, and so let's determine how this comes, up, comes apart here. So our function does pass through the point 0, 1, and 1 half. Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is when you're trying to graph an exponential function, or in this case, come up with the formula the graph's already given, your first target is going to be the plus k. That's who you should go after first. And the, that's because the shift is actually the most obvious of all of these uh, parameters here because the location of the horizontal asymptote is going to give you this shifting value right here because for an for a untransformed exponential function like if you have y equals a to the x your horizontal asymptote uh, your horizontal asymptote is going to happen at the x-axis so if you shifted things whoop you go up by a factor of k that takes the x-axis and then it moves it up as well and so the location of the horizontal asymptote tells you the shift. So notice our horizontal asymptote is right here. It's at the location y equals 3. That's the k value. So we see that k is going to equal 3, which that's, that's quite helpful here. So then rewriting our equation, we have f of x equals c times 1 half to the x plus 3. All right. Now we have to look at we have to look at the C value right here, for which we could try to plug in a value, which, hey, if you know the y-intercept, we can plug that in. Plug it in the y-intercept, you would see that f of 0, because it worked great for us last time, f of 0 is equal to C times 1 half to the 0 plus 3. Okay? Well, the nice thing about the y-intercept is when you take a base to the 0 power, it just disappears. Poof! It disappears. And so you end up with C times 1 plus 3, which is just c plus 3. But the y-intercept, according to the graph, is supposed to equal 1, right? So you get 1. And so then solving for c, c is going to equal 1 minus 3, which is equal to negative 2, all right? And so this is the observation I was alluding to toward earlier. Look at the distance between the y-intercept and the horizontal asymptote. How far apart are they? They are two units away from each other. But for your standard exponential function, you have the asymptote, and the graph should be sitting above it. But ours is sitting below it because of the reflection, 
okay? So you wanna take the distance from the y-intercept to the asymptote. And that will give you this number right here. So we actually wanna think of this as a negative distance because our graph sits below its horizontal asymptote, thus agreeing with the negative two we found right here. And so what does this now tell me about my function? We actually have it. We have f of x equals negative two times one half to the x plus three. And so we are able to figure out this function right here. Now you'll notice that on this example, I provided to you the base, but all the other previous examples, I didn't provide to you the base. We had to solve for it. So really, if we wanted to do the whole enchilada, we'd be given a function like f of x equals c times a to the x plus three, uh, plus k, right? And by the steps we took here, we are able to determine the shift just by the location of the asymptote. We're able to find the scalar C by looking at the difference between the y-intercept and the asymptote. We haven't yet used anything that would actually give, be given by the one half here. So that's where actually this third point, the, the second point, excuse me, comes into play here. If you were trying to compute that, you would plug in the point one comma two, you would get F of one is equal to two, but it's also equal to C, which we know to be negative one half times A, a to the first right, plus three, for which, okay, what's going on here? You could subtract three from both sides. You're going to get negative one is equal to negative two A, right? Divide both sides by two and you get A equals one half. So we could have actually figured out the base. I didn't have to tell it to you. So it's like secret, secret, secret. Oh, we found out that it's supposed to be a one half. We can solve for it. And that's because we used the value A equals one. All right, but what if we wanna use a different point? Uh, like if we put the different point over here where two equals whatever it turned out to be. It would be just like we did before. You'd have to, you have a square here, you have to take the square root. And so we can put all of these ingredients together. Um, we, if, if we know basically two points on the graph, uh, particularly if we know the y-intercept, we know the location of the horizontal asymptote, and we have any other point on the graph, then we can take our function y equals c a to the x plus k, and we can come up with a formula that will match that exponential growth. And this can be done for any exponential function under the sun.